All right. Marlo set the stage. I am now going to talk about some of the science that we're doing on the lake that is helping us to understand. This is the ship that uh, Philip was talking about. Some of, have any of anyone else been on this ship or maybe seen it? It's, it's harbored in Gimli. It's our research vessel. We use this for both our education program and our science program. And Lake Winnipeg, as Marlo mentions, it's an enormous body of water and it's very dangerous. People die on it every year. This allows us to study the lake safely. Recently, we've acquired a new vessel called the Philia right here. Oh no, oh here, oh there. Oh, <laughs> not too bad an angle. Anyways, it's on there. This is a much smaller vessel. It'll allow us to sample the near shore area of the lake. And you'll see why that's important as I start to talk about some of the changes that are occurring in the lake. So eutrophication, it's when humans add too many nutrients or food to a lake or, or a water body. And the lake responds, and this is one of the responses we see. This is an algal bloom that's washed up on the beach. Now we're talking about eutrophication in Lake Winnipeg today, but this is a problem that's occurring around the world. It's occurring in freshwater and salt. Certainly not unique to Lake Winnipeg, but it is a problem. And why is it a problem? If you're a fisherman on the lake, uh, watching today, it can, it can cause problems. It can also actually be a benefit. We'll, we'll, we'll see that later. All sorts of reasons why. If you're interested in exploring them, uh, there are certainly many. And it's difficult to talk about one without talking about another because they're all connected. Talk about the ecological changes, the health risks, and impacts on the fisheries. I imagine there are, uh, there's, well, most, most people are interested in fish. These other things, sustainability, that refers to sort of a supply and demand. There's only a limited supply of phosphorus in this, on this planet, but we need phosphorus to grow food. So we have an unlimited people uh, that need to grow food, and yet here we are wasting something that's in finite supply and actually ruining our waters at the same time. So we have to start thinking a little, a little, a little better in terms of uh, our, for our own safety, in fact. So before we look at changes in an ecosystem, it's good to step back and look at how a system functions before we start to mess around with it. So this is a lake. I wish my pointer worked. Let's see if I can. I guess it just doesn't like the screen or something. This is a side view of a lake. And the little green dots at the top are algae or phytoplankton. And they're like little plants. So they carry out photosynthesis by using energy from the the water and the atmosphere and they use the energy and nutrients to grow. I put water clarity because that's something we measure on the ship and when you study lakes that's something that's really important because that light from the sun has to get through the water and if your water is too murky it can't get through and then you you tend not to have algal blooms. You need clear water. It's important to have a diverse community of algae because they serve as the base of the food chain. They're food for the small animals known as zooplankton, little teeny animals that float around in the water column. And as part of our education program, this is Philip participated in the sampling of some of these things when he came out on the ship and, and other schools can do that as well. Zooplankton again, important to have a diverse community because they're food for the small fish in the lake. And in turn, they're, they're food for the larger um, sometimes commercially valuable fish as well, such as uh, pickerel. And then we mustn't forget those little guys that live in the bottom of the lake that you step on sometimes when you're swimming. They're known as the benthos, and they're important to some fish that feed on the bottom, like whitefish, and they can also recycle nutrients. Super simple food chain. In real life, it's more complicated than that, but it illustrates two very important nutrients and algae aren't bad until they become uh, in excess, largely due to our activities. Form, they form the base of the food, food chain. They're essential to an ecosystem. And secondly, all of these organisms depend on one another. There's an interdependence here. So when we come along and disrupt either the base of the food chain where the algae are, or the fish at the top, or maybe something in the middle, we can cause consequences elsewhere within the food chain that we don't necessarily see. So for example, today we're talking about excess nutrients entering a lake. We add excess nutrients from all sorts 
right? And the lake responds. A very visible response is the, the prolific growth of algae. We see that, but we don't necessarily see what else is going on down there. And that's why we need to study the lake. So today I'm gonna to talk about the changes in the algal community at the base of the food web and the changes at the top of the food web with the fish. And then a few things thrown in in between like exotic species just to make things all the more complicated. So this is a satellite image of Lake Winnipeg taken in 2005, I believe. Yeah. And the white bit at the top is a cloud. You can see that there's the north basin is covered in green. That's an algal bloom. Algal blooms occur naturally in nature. But when they're this large, that's due to human activities. So what we're seeing in the last 20 odd years is larger blooms, uh, more frequent blooms, and they're dominated by blue-green algae, as, as Marlo mentioned. And in recent years, we've also noted a really significant annual variability. And I, I had to take out a lot of data. If you're interested in anything that we touch on that don't go into detail, just ask later or contact us later. Um, so really important here is the blue-green algae. Now, there are all sorts of different kinds of algae, different groups of algae. One group is known as the blue-green algae. Um, and there are all sorts of different kinds of blue-green algae. So we're not talking about just one organism here. We're talking about different kinds. And what makes them so special? They have a number of different characteristics. I can't go into much detail, but I actually have a handout, in case I forget to mention it later, that, that goes into more detail. They're not actually algae. They are bacteria. They have a different cell wall than algae, but they can carry out photosynthesis. So they use energy from the sun to grow in the water. And one thing that they can do when there's not enough nitrogen in the water, they can take it from the atmosphere. So they can actually, and there's an endless supply in the atmosphere, they can convert a gas into a form of nitrogen that they can use to grow. And that allows them to outcompete other organisms. And I mean, these guys have been around for a couple billion years. So they've, they're, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere uh, on Earth. So they've, they've learned some tricks during that time. Another thing they've learned that allows them to compete other organisms is they can regulate their buoyancy, some of them. So when the light conditions, and light is key for photosynthetic organisms, light conditions aren't quite optimal, they'll just move around until they find a good spot to carry out photosynthesis. And that again allows them to outcompete other, other types of algae in the lake. So, so what? So big deal, we have a lot of blue-green algae. Well, there are some important <clears throat> uh, other traits that, that uh, come along with blue-green algae. One of them is their nutritional value. We don't really understand yet how nutritious they are. Don't forget, it's not just about us, it's about the organisms that depend on them as well. So the zooplankton that eat algae. Some of these guys, like that first picture there, they're quite large when you look under a microscope, much larger than the zooplankton that eat them. Some of them also have slimy coating, which makes them not as palatable. If you depend on the lake for water, they can smell bad and taste bad, so not so good. And they can also produce toxins, some of in your nervous system. So that's a very important health concern, especially when you have these enormous blooms forming on the lake. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. Microcystin is one of many different kinds of toxins. And this data set was by, taken by the, um, the province of Manitoba. On the y-axis, y being the taller axis, uh, we have concentration of this particular toxin. And on the x-axis, we have different parts of the lake, the open water for the North Basin, Narrows, and South Basin. And then on the far end is the near shore area in the South Basin where the beaches are, where the people are. And the little red line that's going across there, that's the drinking water guideline. So you can see on average, over that time period, there's a, there's a, it's, it exceeds the drinking water guideline that's set out by the province. Offshore, it's below the detection limit for this particular analysis. Quality guideline, which is what we want to, to consider when we're going, say, swimming or water skiing, where you might ingest a little, but you're not going to be drinking it. Um, on average, this, this toxin is far guideline. So the media tends to describe Lake Winnipeg as toxic. Some of you may have heard that description. Or they see an algal bloom, they go, toxic algal bloom. Based on the data, uh, aren't true. 
That's not to say that it's not going to change. It's a very dynamic system, especially with zebra mussels now in the lake. There's a there is a possibility that we will see changes in the in the toxin production. Currently, they are far below the recreational water quality guideline, which could be considered a good thing. But overall, you don't know unless you test the water. You can't tell by looking at it. So just to be safe, it's best not to play in. Sometimes it's fun covering yourself in algae just for just for kicks. It's best not to do that because some of them can be volatile as well. You don't want to breathe them in. These huge algal blooms is low oxygen. And this is, again, where the media likes to jump in. Look, when, you're, when there's low oxygen, what do you eventually you start to die. And that applies to organisms in water as well. Very few organisms can live without oxygen. Some bacteria, but that's it. So how does you, how do you go from an organism, photosynthetic organism, produces oxygen during the day and consumes oxygen at night? Where do we get low oxygen from that? Well, eventually, as all things do, it, it may, it'll die and it could sink to the bottom of the lake and decompose. And that's a process that consumes oxygen. So we're tipping the balance between production and what's being consumed. And that can cause problems in a lake because things start to choke and die. Before I talk about Lake Winnipeg oxygen data, I'd just like to remind you that fetch. So when it's windy, it can mix. So some of these blooms get dispersed in the water. Another fate is being eaten. This is food, potential food for organisms like zooplankton and bentho. So it could also be eaten. But let's just pretend that the bloom fell to the bottom of the lake, enormous bloom decomposing on the bottom of the lake. What ultimately happens depends on the kind of lake that we're talking about. On the far left, uh, we have a shallow lake. Both lakes have something decomposing in the bottom. We have a shallow lake. When there's decomposition occurring at the bottom, oxygen can get mixed in from the atmosphere, actually all the way to the bottom, so that oxygen can be replenished. In a deep lake, however, it's too deep. So near the bottom of the lake, it's cold, it's not mixed. And so if something is decomposing at the bottom and it's not getting replenished, that oxygen isn't being replenished, we can have what's known as a dead zone. And that's where the media loves to say Lake Winnipeg is dying because of these dead zones. Is this actually true based on the science that we're doing in the lake? This is, um, we have on the y-axis depth of the Great Lakes in North America. And I've separated the North and South Basin of Lake Winnipeg, which is on the, on the right-hand side. You can see Lake Winnipeg's a shallow lake. And we thought shallow lake, well mixed, awesome. We don't have to worry despite these large algal plumes. But in 2003, we measured an, an area of low oxygen in the North Basin, and the red circle there shows where that is. And then we measured again in 2006 and 2007, around the same place. This is a very the, among the deeper parts of the lake, and that's where the blooms form, in the North Basin typically, because it's clearer in the North Basin. South Basin, if any of you have been swimming in the South, you know it's pretty murky, a lot of sediment, so that prevents the algae from growing. It's in the North where they typically form. But really, in the, in the last 10 years or so, we haven't seen regular oxygen depletion events. We haven't measured them, at least. Maybe we need to get out there more often. Maybe we need to have a higher resolution sampling scheme. But based on the data we have, they don't occur every year. So this crazy idea that there's a dead zone in Lake Winnipeg that's getting bigger and bigger every year, and eventually the lake's going to die because it's choked to death, it's simply not true. Occasionally, we do see low oxygen, though but it's still fair to describe Lake Winnipeg as a shallow, well-mixed lake. That's not to diminish the severity of the problem. There is still, a, it is a problem, but you know, you, you can describe it more accurately by not saying that it's dying. Quota species, so now we're at the top of the food chain. What's going on with the fish? These are the three species that are fished commercially on Lake Winnipeg. So there's white fish, feed on the bottom, sauger and walleye, or pickerel. And quota species mean they're, they're fished in a quota. So fishermen have a quota. They can catch a certain amount of fish. After that, they have to stop. <clears throat> these are commercial data. So we have on the y-axis, these are the fish that are delivered by fishermen on Lake Winnipeg over time since the mid-1970s. So there's pickerel, walleye. 
And you can see since the mid-1990s, walleye has increased uh, in, in terms of the deliveries that the fishermen have been making. And this shouldn't be super surprising when you think of it, because Lake Winnipeg is a productive lake. It's not dead, it's the opposite, it's productive. There's a lot of nutrients, a lot of algae, a lot of food for these organisms. Why wouldn't the highest predator in the lake benefit to a certain extent as well? So this has certainly been seen in other lakes. It shouldn't come as a surprise to a point until the conditions deteriorate to such an extent that they can't do very well. But then when you look at the other two commercial species, we have sauger and whitefish, and the trend certainly isn't the same. Why not? We don't really fully understand yet. And as I said, these are commercial data. And so you have to be careful because economics and all sorts of other things play into an, the interpretation of data like this. For example, walleye is the highest priced fish, and fishermen can actually target the fish that they that they go for. So obviously they're going to fill their quota with a fish that pays them more than say white fish, which is actually considered a junk fish on Lake Winnipeg and a lot of it apart from the Norway house fishers, that's largely what they fish. So they, they'll actually throw away their white fish so they don't have a cheap fish as part of their quota. So that could certainly affect the interpretation of these data. Another thing that could, could, could impact the interpretation is this little guy. And I actually brought one case I forget later. This is rainbow smelt and it, it's an exotic species that entered the lake in 1990 and it lives in the North Basin of Lake Winnipeg. And interestingly, walleye in the North Basin, that prized fish, feeds almost exclusively on smelt in the North Basin. So an exotic species has become a very important food item for the most prized fish that we, we catch commercially that could also be contributing to the higher yield of walleye. So very difficult to interpret um, based on these data. Um, but one thing you can certainly tell from, from, from looking at this data set is that something's going on since the it was chugging along quite consistently until then. And so certainly nutrients play a role, probably smelt as well and probably some other factors. The big question for managers is this sustainable say there's lots of fish. We want more, to, we want our quota increase so we can earn more money. Understandable. The managers are saying, well, we don't really understand what's driving all of these fish and we don't know what's around the corner. In where the, the population just declines. So big question that needs to be answered. Now another exotic species is the zebra mussel and that's the most recent invader in Lake Winnipeg and likely won't have quite the consequences that the rainbow smelt have had. This is a distribution map. You can see that there are quite We have uh, Lake Winnipeg and I circled Tennessee and it was it Nashville, Tennessee or I think there's another one. Maybe if Texas is on there, Texas has zebra mussels as well. So we can learn from their experience which is kind of the only benefit of them already being being here. They haven't been in Lake Winnipeg long enough to for us to really ecosystem, but the, the changes could be profound. Some general characteristics of zebra mussels. One is that they're filter feeders. So they filter the water and they can filter up to a liter per day per mussel. And um, Marlo brought, this is a whole bunch of them. Um, so we'll show that around later. Teeny little mussel can filter a liter a day and they filter out the algae. They can also grow to really high densities and quite well if they're un living in conditions that they enjoy. So they can grow up to 100,000 individuals per cubic meter. So they actually grow on top of each other. And consequently, they produce a lot of waste, a lot of waste. And this is key to understanding how they can completely disrupt this whole ecosystem. So uh, we call it pseudo, pseudo feces. Marlo calls it pseudo poo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's key. So remember that they produce a lot of waste. So some consequences. Filter feeders filter out algae. I think that might be a good thing, except other organisms depend on that algae for food. They can also um, selectively feed the good, potentially toxin producing algae that in the water. So that's not a good thing. When you filter that much water, you clear 
Clearer water means light can penetrate more deeply, and it can also increase the temperature of the water. So physically, this habitat's very profoundly changed due to the presence of zebra mussels. Nutrient-related consequences is really, that, that pseudofeces is really key there. What happens when zebra mussels do really experience of other lakes, not Lake Winnipeg yet. We're yet to see what happens in Lake Winnipeg. The pseudofeces is nutrient rich. So what we're seeing in other lakes is nutrient rich near shore in the sediment. And this is creating more productive environment because there's more food there at the expense of the offshore parts of the lake, which are now becoming less productive in some of these lakes, both in the water column and also in the sediment. So we're seeing shifts in the biota or the animals in the lake in response to where the food is. So we're seeing more of those little guys sampled when he was on the ship. They tend to increase in densities near shore. And so bottom feeders like well, so generally they like it cold and deep. Now they have to come inshore to look for food where it's clearer and warmer and they may find their food, but they're pretty stressed out looking for it. Plus they might expend more energy looking for it as well. So the bottom feeders could be impacted. That highly prized fish, the walleye, doesn't like it super murky. It's, it's, it fishes by sight. Doesn't like it super murky, but it also doesn't like it really clear either. So when we have this clear, warm water, it's not very happy. Offshore, there's not a lot of food left. So what is, it has to find refugia to, to thrive. So there could be really important consequences all the way up to the top uh, organisms in the lake due to zebra mussels. Aesthetically, you might think, well, at least we'll have clear water. Uh, there's one good thing, but clear water means other things can grow that are photosynthetic. So maybe not plankton, plankton float around in the water, but algae that attaches to things such as the sediment, the bottom <coughs> of the lake where all the nutrients are now, they can really do well. So this is Cladophora, it's a type of algae that's thriving in Lake Erie and other lakes that have zebra mussels. And it's, its nickname is elephant snout. It's not a very nice name, but it's, it's really slimy and, and when it detaches, it washes up on the beach in these huge mats. And also associated with this are really, really high counts of bacteria. So again, you know, we have that whole health concern associated with it. So very, very, very complex. And you can see how these things exacerbate other things. So here we have the simple food web, increasingly complex due to the introduction of just a couple exotic species. And there are way more exotic species in Lake Winnipeg than what I talked about. This little guy here, Bythotrephes, is a, is a type of zooplankton, but it's a predator. So it eats other zooplankton. So we have a lot of organisms that eat zooplankton. And when you don't have much zooplankton, the algae can grow. So actually the <laughs> organisms themselves can affect the algal growth in the lake. So it's getting really complicated and science being done on the lake, we're only just starting to understand what some of these changes mean and what they will mean in the future for you know the fishermen and the recreational users, all the important things that Marlo mentioned earlier on. We're only scratching the surface, but that doesn't mean that we can't start to do things to help remedy the situation. And one thing we do know, phosphorus contributes to the prolific growth of algae. And that's where the Lake Winnipeg Foundation is starting with their, um, with their work in their eight-point health plan. And that's where I'll hand it over to Marlo. Thank you. I guess we'll... Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to fly through the last part of my presentation to make sure there's time for questions. Um, and I want to talk about solutions because Karen's right. A lot of times when you hear the lake is dying, there's these huge algae blooms and it's the 10th largest freshwater lake in the world and it makes people want to go, oh, there's nothing we can do about this. And that's wrong. There's lots of things we can do about it. Humans, we're pretty smart as a species. So we've, we can certainly solve this problem on this lake. <clears throat> But I know you're all here for zebra mussels. I don't kid myself. So before I go any further, I just want to take a moment. At the end, feel free to come up and touch these guys. They're dead. They won't hurt you. Um, for folks watching, I'm about to walk up to the camera and so you can get a closer look. These are little zebra mussels. <clears throat> we always say they're fingernail sized and people are like, oh, they're so small. They really are fingernail sized. And when you look at this specimen, 
which is just in resin, you'll note that there's a little rock here that originally some of these zebra mussels stuck to. It's called a substrate, a hard surface. And then the mussels become their own substrate. So what they do is they can just explode over anything hard. So boats, hydro dams, nuclear power plants, anything that's in these freshwater uh, systems. So I'm just going to take a moment for our friends online. I'm going to walk up to this camera. I don't know if you can hear me at this point, but hopefully you can see these little zebra mussels. There's the rock that they're on. So here are these new invaders in our um, and like I said, for folks here in the room, I'll pass these around after. <clears throat> so, um, solutions. Let's talk solutions. We have an eight-point health plan. Shared responsibility for our lake. Um, you can't point fingers and you can't blame people for what's happening in the lake. And it's very tempting to say, you know what, it's hog farmers. If they just dealt with their pig poop, we wouldn't have this problem. Because then hog farmers can say, you know, Winnipeg, maybe you shouldn't dump raw sewage in the rivers, right? So instead of pointing blame at different um, parts of society, what our plan recognizes is that we're all part of the problem, but also we're all part of the solution. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a politician, whether you're a grade four student, whether you're a scientist, or whether you work for an environmental charity like I do, there's roles and things that we can all do. So I'm going to jump into it. So action, or it has eight actions. You know, I'm just going to skip two because I'm going to talk to all of them. Action one, keeping water on the land. So this, right now, nature has a natural ecosystem, prairie wetlands, that help filter nutrients and other pollutions out of the water. And so a wetland, for folks who maybe aren't familiar with the term, is basically any area of land that holds water, whether it's temporary or permanently. So swamps ponds, bogs, things like that. <clears throat> but this definition really sells wetlands short. They're actually really vibrant and diverse ecosystems. There's all sorts of bugs and amphibians, um, tons of birds, and also larger mammals that depend on the vegetation and the biodiversity within these ecosystems to live. Um, and then they do other things too. They mitigate the impact of floods and droughts, and they act as carbon sinks. So they're a great climate change mitigation tool. Now, in Manitoba, a lot of our prairie wetlands have been drained for agricultural use or other industry use. And so what we're saying with this action is let's retain, let's conserve the remaining wetlands that we have because Mother Nature has green infrastructure. Not all infrastructure is concrete. And this green natural infrastructure that is prairie wetlands is part of the solution to some of the challenges facing like Winnipeg. Action two is very similar, which is about conserving the boreal forest. So in Canada, Canada's boreal forest, which stretches all across the country, it's one of the largest intact forest ecosystems left in the world. And like, it's full of wetlands as well, by the way. And so like wetlands, and because it includes wetlands within it, all those trees and whatnot, uh, it filters nutrients and uh, you know, other pollutants from water that flows through it. This is a map that um, was from an educational supplement that uh, LWF, my organization, helped create. I'm going to leave a bunch of stuff behind, including this supplement. And I wanted to point out, um, so here's Lake Winnipeg. And again, it looks really rinky-dink, but remember, 10th largest freshwater lake in the world. It's a huge body of water. So this area here, that's the watershed, 1 million square kilometers. And that green swath, that's boreal forest in Canada. So a lot of times people think of Manitoba as the vast majority of our landscape is boreal. And right now, Manitoba's boreal uh, is relatively intact and relatively action is that let's just keep it that way because keeping it that way through conservation and through smart and sustainable development. So not to say we can't mine or we can't um, log, but that we can do it in a smart, sustainable way. Um, I can't resist my animal picture. So again, boreal forest, much like wetlands, diverse, full of life. Uh, about a million migratory birds come through every year to spot to uh, to uh, lay their eggs and have their babies. Um, and we've got herds of threatened caribou that rely on this area as well. Our third priority is to deal with point sources of nutrient loading. <clears throat> and a point source, an easy way to think of this term, is something you can point to. So point sources are localized. 
they are contained sources of nutrient pollution, which means once again, I am talking about poop and also pee. Um, we're talking about humid sewage words like effluent, but really it comes down to poop. It comes down to the stuff we're flushing down our toilets. Human sewage from municipal water treatment facilities and lagoons throughout Manitoba contribute one quarter, 25% of phosphorus inputs to Lake Winnipeg. That's significant. And the city's wastewater treatment plants, there's three in the cities, they're the single largest point source of phosphorus. Uh, the North End's plant, uh, is the fourth largest phosphorus polluter among industrial facilities in Canada. And why is that? Well, because it hasn't been upgraded in a long time to be able to more effectively remove phosphorus and other nutrients. And why hasn't it been upgraded? Because it costs a lot of money to upgrade these plants. Uh, it was supposed to be done by 2014. You will note we are now in 2015. It still hasn't been upgraded. And city staff are now saying that it probably won't be complete until 2019. And all that time, these nutrients continue to be um, put into our watershed and eventually make their way into our lake. Now, <clears throat> there are many ways to keep sewage out of our lakes and rivers. Rural uh, municipalities use lagoons, and again, when those were designed, they weren't designed with the understanding of the connection between phosphorus and eutrophication. So what we're saying with this plan is that we want to start getting smarter and getting more innovative in how we treat our waste. Um, particularly because we need to demonstrate some leadership here if we expect other jurisdictions throughout that vast watershed to follow suit. So how can we as Winnipeg say, yo Edmonton, we need you to spend $600 million, that's more than half a billion dollars to upgrade your sewage treatment plant if we're not going to do it ourselves. This is our backyard. So what we're saying is let's step up and let's set the standard here. Action and this basically means to ensure that we're collecting accurate information that's responsive to different changes, changes in the landscape, changes in the season. So how do we know if the actions that we're taking are having the right effect if we don't actually look at what's happening in our waterways? So for example, before and after snowfall would be a great time to check out what's happening in our rivers and what's the levels of nutrients and other pollutants. Before and after flood events, that would be a pretty interesting thing to know. How does flooding affect the amount of nutrients being washed into waterways? So this action, smart monitoring, will help us make future decisions and help us streamline and change our actions to make sure that they're having the most effective um, uh, consequences. <clears throat> Managing our shorelines. Uh, to our lake, but it'll also protect important fish and wildlife habitats. Shorelines are the last natural line of defense when it comes to landscape and lake. And shorelines are also where most humans have their first interaction with lakes, right? It's where you go swimming on beaches. It's where you jump off docks at the cabin or the cottage. It's where you put your boat in at the piers. So in 2011, LWF um, initiated a sensitive habitat a shim and basically it sounds really fancy but basically a bunch of researchers went out in boats and they looked at different segments of the shoreline along the south each segment of shoreline uh, to sensitivity and suitability for development rehabilitation and protection so some say you know yeah this one's kind of degraded we could build cottages there you know it's not going to really impact our surrounding environment whereas this piece this is really critical habitat so we want to keep this one pristine and so our goal is to use this data to create shoreline management planning tools or as decision-making tools for governments. Now some shoreline marshes are already threatened areas and one of these marshes is the Netley Lebeau Marsh which is the southern base of Lake Winnipeg. It's really big. Apparently we do everything big in Manitoba. It's one of the largest freshwater coastal wetlands in Canada. It's more than seven times the size of Birds Hill Park for folks who are familiar with that. Uh, but it's not right now functioning as a healthy wetland. From 1979 to 2001, open water has increased 
more open water you have, the less vegetation you have. And you remember from action one, we love marshland vegetation because that's the stuff that helps filter out that phosphorus. So one of the things that we're doing as part of our work is we organized a workshop this past September to look at ways of potentially rehabilitating part of the Netley Lebeau Marsh. And we brought in experts from around the province, we brought in um, an expert from Ontario, and actually an expert from Hungary. Because again, these problems that we're experiencing, whether it's marsh um, uh, depletion, whether it's shoreline erosion, whether it's eutrophication, they're happening in ecosystems all around the world. If we could perhaps restore the most equal, uh, ecologically valuable parts of the marsh. <clears throat> Action six is promoting agricultural water stewardship. This basically means let's keep phosphorus and other nutrients on farms and out of our lake. And so when we're talking about this, we're talking about BMPs or best management practices. So this is things like how you till your land, um, different ways of feeding your animals, uh, managing your manure, right? You don't let your cows poop right beside a river because then when it rains, it's gonna wash that stuff in and on it goes down to the lake. So again, it's not about stopping farming. Farming is very important to Manitoba's economy, but it's about farming smart. And it's about taking steps that will benefit local producers, while also helping restore and protect the health of Lake Winnipeg. I know I'm going really fast, but it's because I want to make sure there's time for questions. Uh, and I will be leaving and learning more. Action seven is investing in a clean water economy. And this is about encouraging through policy, um, through business, the innovative technologies that can reduce phosphorus levels, reduce nutrient levels, but also make us money because who doesn't like to make money? And as Karen was mentioning, phosphorus is a good thing. Phosphorus helps plants grow, which means it's actually critical to global food security. And so if we can figure out a way to harvest you know, have it in our hands from our watershed, we could potentially sell it to other jurisdictions that need it, or we could use it ourselves here to help grow our food. And there's some really cool projects happening throughout our province that are exploring this concept of, you know, innovation in the landscape. And one of those projects is harvesting cattails, which is a really common wetland plant, from marshes and ditches uh, in marshes like Netley Lebeau, in a place called Pelly's Lake in southern Manitoba, and even within the city limits, um, just from the ditches and stuff. And what they're doing, um, the International Institute of Sustainable Development, which is a really cool organization with headquarters here in Winnipeg, is just taking these cattails and other native prairie grasses, right, that have sucked that um, into fuel. Some of them are gases, some of them are fuel pellets or cubes, and then they're using this fuel uh, as, the... again, I will toss these around. I have some here. These are little fuel pellets that were made from cattail, and these pellets are being used right now in um, the Living Prairie Museum their organization. So now they don't have to buy anything. We've actually just made it from things that have to be harvested anyway throughout our landscape. And just for our folks uh, online, I'm going to walk up to the camera again so you can see these. They don't look particularly exciting, but pellets. So again, if we can develop some innovative policies for water and nutrient management, it's a win-win. We can have a healthy economy and we can have a healthy lake. Final action is about all of you and all of your teachers and me and Karen and scientists and government and your parents and future generations as well. And it's about taking responsibility. Again, recognizing that we have restoring and protecting the health of our lake and that the actions of individuals make a difference. Seven million people live in this water. It is our collective responsibility to save our Great Lake. And being invited to speak to you here and to speak to the folks online, fresh water, and that they do want to be a part of the solution. And I want to just take a moment to let folks know, because I know a lot of under 18s watching, and don't let you have no power because that's a lie you have lots of power you're smart you're online you understand media and technology and you can make a huge difference um, at lake winnipeg foundation we think our health plan can help guide future work 
by pushing for action and a sense of urgency, while also ensuring that the actions we take, um, that there's science behind it. So that we're not just going out willy-nilly and scatter shots trying to you know, fix these problems, which could cause more problems, in fact, itself. We wanna make sure that we are scientifically sound. We also think our plan can be a model that can be exported to other jurisdictions, because as we're saying here, there's lots of all around the globe. So let's pool our expertise and let's get moving on action. Lake Winnipeg is our great lake and its health is in our hands. So with our final action of our plan, consider what does it mean to be a steward of our shared waters? What does it mean to be a consumer with purchasing power? And what does it mean to be a citizen who lives in a democracy where the collective voice of the people influence the laws of the land. What if every amount of water that you had to interact with during the day, what if you had to drink it? How would that change how you interact with water, right? In Canada, we often forget, we're, we're lucky, we have lots of fresh water, but a lot of other places don't, right? Fresh water is a finite, precious resource. And so, Consider it that way, right? And how will that change the way we interact with the water all around us? So I'm gonna leave it there because again, we do wanna leave a little bit of time for questions. We certainly can go into more specifics. Karen, did you wanna come on up and join me here? Sure. Um, and at this point, I think I'll turn it over to our hosts um, to facilitate the question for specific actions or about anything else we've talked about today um, or anything else you folks would like to talk about. So thank you very much. Well, slide over. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to keep the mics on mute, and if there's a question, someone on the screen waves your waves, raise your hand, and I'll point to you, and you'll ask your question. If someone in the audience wants to ask a question, put up your hand, and I'll point to you, and you'll just come stand here close enough because our mic is here, and we want them to answer questions. So right off the bat, we'll start at home. Is there anyone here? Trethar, come on forward. <laughs> come on down. <laughs> Just talk from there, they can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we recently elected a new mayor here in Winnipeg, uh, and I was wondering if uh, this new mayor, compared to the old one, has made any commitments towards the health of Lake Winnipeg or it happening in the future, like whether it'll be easier to work with. So, I, can, I can take that one if you... Um, for I don't know if can folks online did yeah okay great um, we are a collaborative organization as a environmental charity so we'll work with anyone party of politics um, the encouraging news that I can share was before this past election there was an environmental forum where all mayoral candidates but one Brian Bowman and uh, one of the questions that was asked at that, it was really well attended, by the way, it was pretty exciting, standing room only. One of the questions was asked about sewage treatment and about specifically the upgrades to the North End, also uh, supposed to undergo some upgrades. And across the board, all mayoral candidates who were there, absolutely committed to completing the upgrades by or before 2019. So I, I have that on tape, I, I wrote it down, um, as well, when he was answering that question, did say that it was, and I'm quoting him, not only a legal issue, but a moral issue. So that gives me some hope that the new civic administration recognizes and will take this seriously, um, but time will tell. And the city of Winnipeg does contribute a small amount to the research on Lake Winnipeg annually, and there's been no talk of them withdrawing that fund the those funds so that's a good sign as well hmm. other questions don't all put your hand up at once <laughs> yeah oh sorry no that's okay I'm motivated to come on up to <laughs> uh, my name is miss horsline from elmwood high i am the science teacher math teacher sustainability mentor and one of the questions i have um was life video they alluded to uh one of the consequences coming from Manitoba Hydro and their dams disrupting the natural flow of water. 
And during that video, Manitoba Hydro did not comment on their position for Lake Winnipeg. I'm just wondering if you guys have any insight on that. The problem with anything like hydroelectric development is that to really prove something, you need pre-development data to demonstrate that a change has occurred. And unfortunately, we did extensive data sets before Lake Winnipeg became a reservoir. So it's very hard to prove anything scientifically. So that's a challenge. Um, we can we can guess. I mean, you know, the the the, the levels uh, have been changed. Um, there are some benefits to that and some disadvantages. One of the benefits is that there's a there's now a two what's called two mile channel, and and that allows the water to leave the lake faster. So in years of high rainfall, which is what we're periods of high rainfall, which is what we're in now, water there there's actually less flooding, uh, accelerated exit from the lake, and there's also less. There's less variability in the because it's regulated. Less variability. Like, that's bad for marshes because marshes need to go up and down, um, but we don't have the data to actually prove that it's adversely affected from before it was actually created. I could conclude, but unfortunately, without the data. Um, also, there's uh, you know the, the fishers in the North Basin, uh, through their local knowledge, have have seen more erosion on the on the north shore of the lake as well so um i mean local knowledge is valuable unfortunately um when you don't see a number sometimes people don't don't pay as much attention so it's sort of i don't know that's a bit of a muddled answer but yes and no we have seen things but we don't have the data to prove anything and to that i'll just add uh join in to say our answer is generally we don't know um our science advisory council has shared the same thing that we think that there isn't a real uh, link between um, monitoring or uh, regulation of the lake and phosphorus levels per se, a, a link between regulation of the lake and marsh health. Um, but there's not enough studying being done. So because we're science-based, we are we hate to you know to say anything. We don't have this. We want to study it more. We want to know more. Um, I would also just like to add though that when you think about holistic health of 